Welcome back to what must by now seem like a, a course in Parables 101 that you'll get credit for on your transcript at the end of the semester. We're looking through Matthew's Gospel and uh, we're in the middle of a barrage of parables that Jesus shared and Matthew collected for disciples in his day and through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in our day as well. If you were trying to convince a child to clean his plate at lunch, you might try a list of facts and figures about nutrition. But you'd be better off if you read him Dr. Seuss's Green Eggs and Ham, right? The power of a story. Uh, and it's not just for kids. If you're trying to impress on grown-ups the uh, inhumanity of the Holocaust, statistics won't do it. But a story like Anne Frank or Cory Ten Boom will. And Jesus knew that better than anyone. Uh, master storyteller. And in the parables, we're catching some of that uh, powerful teaching of Jesus through the parables that he shared. Uh, stories can catch our interest. Stories can involve our emotions more than many forms of teaching can. Stories stick with us in our memories. And it's not to say facts and figures aren't important. They are, obviously. But studies show that stories are retained longer. That, that we not only grasp them in the moment, but we were able to carry them away with us easier than we can many other forms of teaching. So when, when we read the Gospels and we see the abundance of parables that Jesus told, uh, it's a reminder of their effectiveness, not just then, but now. We're 2,000 years later, these stories still haven't gotten old. 2,000 years later, they're still communicating the gospel to us today. So today's study, if you've looked at the, uh, at the quarterly for today, we are still in third week in a row, Matthew 13, because Jesus just poured parables into that section of his teaching that we're still exploring. We have two pairs of parables today. We have a pair of parables about the value of God's kingdom, and we have a pair of parables about God's incredible growth projection for his kingdom. So let's start with the growth stories. Uh, Matthew 13, 31, we hear about a mustard seed. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it's the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it's the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. If you and I were following Jesus 2,000 years ago, if we were in those crowds who heard his teaching for the first time uh, live and in person, I'm guessing that we would be awed by his miracles. I'm guessing that we would be stunned by his teaching, which is so different. Uh, uh, repeatedly, we see it in the Gospels, no one taught like him. I'm guessing that we would be thrilled by the fact that he stood up to the Pharisees the way that he did. But we might also wonder, and there's evidence that these first listeners did, we might also wonder if Messiah has come with all of these wonderful signs and wonders and with this marvelous teaching, why isn't everybody flocking to him? Why is there opposition? Why are the crowds, even in this year of popularity, this second year of Jesus' ministry when, when his fame is beginning to spread and we start to see larger and larger groups, it's still not everybody. And, and the question may be, uh, we're talking about changing the world here, oh, just us? We're not large enough. And 
will we ever be large enough to make a difference in the greater population? Uh, it's, it's not really doubt that's being expressed, I think. It's more like confusion. Why isn't the kingdom of God that Jesus came to represent, why isn't it growing faster than it has been? And, and, and are we really world changers with a limited number of people that we have so far? We, we aren't even on the radar of the Roman Empire. And it was true, the persecution of the church in Jesus' day was not from Rome. Persecution of the church was through Jewish religious leaders who were stirring the people up against Jesus. And even his crucifixion was, was, was ordered by a somewhat reluctant Roman governor under pressure from Jewish religious leaders who said, this is what you need to do or you'll hear from us about it. There'll be problem in the streets because you didn't. Now later on, there's a great deal of Roman persecution. But at this time, the Romans had given the, the nation of Israel a pass on religious issues because, frankly, they'd had so many headaches uh, from before about uh, the Jewish leaders and people not accepting emperor worship or the Roman pantheon of gods to their credit. They didn't. And Rome said, well, it's not worth hassling you about it. We won't force that on you. We'll just look the other way when you do your religious practices. And then Rome considered the Jesus movement to be a subset of Judaism. So they thought they fell under the same permissive uh, a, a doctrine. But the Jewish religious leaders knew better. And so that's where the opposition's mainly coming from. I say that to say uh, that th this was one of the things probably they were wondering about, and we would wonder about too if we were there in that day. Uh, uh, this is wonderful, Jesus, but this small group, are we going to change the world? How in the world is that going to happen? And Jesus said, consider the mustard seed. It starts out small, doesn't stay that way. Uh, Critics of Jesus have had a field day with his reference to the mustard seed as the smallest of all seeds because they say, although it's very small, even microscopic, there are smaller seeds than the mustard seed. And that's true. But Jesus is addressing Jewish farmers in the Middle East and in their experience, their smallest seed was the mustard seed. So he's not making a universal statement here. He's targeting an audience. And for them, out of their practical experience, this is the smallest seed that they would have planted in their herb garden. In fact, it had already achieved popularity in that day as what we would call today a proverb, probably. People in that day, we've, we have evidence of it from other writings, people in that day were already referring to something as being as small as a mustard seed. So it's kind of like, what are the odds that the Panthers will ever get back to the Super Bowl? Well, have you, <laughs> have you heard of the mustard seed, <laughs> is the idea. So, so here's what Jesus said. Look at what this seed produces. Look at the difference that it makes. Mustard seeds typically grew eight, nine, ten feet high. Uh, Jesus says a tree, it, it, it technically is a bush, but when it's eight or ten feet high, Jesus says it's tree-like in its size. Back to our text, Jesus says, and how about another thing? Verse 33, he told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked through all the dough. Uh, we really, our eyes open wide when we read a modern translation like the NIV here, as opposed to the more familiar King James, which talks about being uh, so many measures of meal, 60 pounds of dough. Any women in earshot would have laughed out loud at that. Absolutely huge. That would make enough yeast rolls for 100 people unless I were at the table. It would be considerably less than 100 people. 
But Jesus is exaggerating intentionally to get their attention and, and exhibiting at the same time this wonderful sense of humor because they would have laughed at that and then they would have learned from it. A side note uh, here is that several commentators make the point that elsewhere in scripture, yeast is used or leaven is used as a symbol of sin. And so they see here a different meaning to this parable. They see this as a warning of Jesus that sin's going to flourish in the church. A little bit of sin is going to grow to make a sinful church. I think they're overthinking it. I think they're assuming that if that's what the application of a, of a metaphor is in one place, it's what that metaphor has to mean in other places as well. But the fact that Jesus is using this next to the parable of the mustard seed seems to me, given his pattern of multiple parables to teach the same lesson, that that's what he's doing here as well. Here, I don't think leaven has a negative meaning here. It does in some other places. Here, I think it's just um, uh, used because of its characteristic. A pinch of yeast can make a big difference in a loaf of bread. Just like a mustard seed may be small, but look what it produces. With these two short parables, Jesus wants his hearers to remember that great results can come from small beginnings. And there are all sorts of examples in scripture of that, of course, in, in the way that, that God used his people throughout history um, to accomplish his purposes, Israel being one of the smallest nations around, but look at the effect that it's had spiritually in the world. Uh, look at the stories from the Old Testament, stories like Gideon with 300, defeating the entire Midianite army. Um, a David, shepherd boy with a sling, brings down Goliath. Um, God had a track record. Small things make big differences. And now we can add to that these two word pictures of a mustard seed and a pinch of yeast. So flash forward in time, was Jesus right? Maybe a handful of followers at first, already starting to grow. Here we're in the middle of Matthew's gospel and we're seeing people coming on board. 3,000 saved on the day of Pentecost. And historians say, incredibly enough, that before Christianity was legalized, in the Roman Empire, 300 years later, within three centuries, 12% of the population of the Mediterranean world was Christian when it was still illegal to be a Christian. One out of every eight persons in the Mediterranean world, and this is secular scholars largely uh, doing the, the math here, they estimate that one out of every eight persons was a Christian when it was still illegal to be a Christian on the verge of Constantine's conversion and Christianity being legalized. A small beginning was already becoming a worldwide phenomenon. And since then, it has continued to spread so that I think Last week we mentioned one-third of all the people on the globe today identify themselves as Christians. Martin Luther planted a mustard seed. He must have felt very alone when he tacked those 95 theses to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany. But look what it produced. John Wesley must have felt very alone when he got kicked out of church after church after church and was reduced end quote, to preaching out in the open air. And God sent a Wesleyan revival that swept through the whole nation of England. In fact, if I can chase this theme one step further, Wesley's spiritual awakening came through 
the ministry of the Moravians in England, who were from the continent of Europe, had fled persecution, had, had brought the gospel with them uh, uh, to find safety and a safe harbor and refuge in England, but then began to go from England all over the world in, in missions. They were led by Count Zinzendorf. He was a wealthy nobleman in Germany in the days of Wesley, but he had a heart for the Lord. And he gave them a home on his estate, these Moravians. He became their leader. He organized them. And uh, it's largely through his ministry then, God used that to reach young John Wesley. Well, I mention that because when Nicholas von Zinzendorf was a college student, he and friends gathered together and decided that they would create a secret order. But this secret order was a spiritual secret order um, and not really too secret. They would pledge themselves to follow New Testament principles, to shape their careers, their homes, their families by New Testament principles for the rest of their lives. And they did that. And they call themselves the order of the mustard seed. So here, another indicator, God is saying, great things are going to come from this movement. Just have faith. Jesus warned that there would be a cost of discipleship, but he also said it would be worth it. And that brings us to the, the next pair of parables in our study in Matthew 13, which has to do with the value of the kingdom. The first two that we looked at, the growth of the kingdom, this has to do with the value of the kingdom. They're about a treasure and a pearl. Verse 44, and, and you notice these are very short, very quick parables. Verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Well, not all the stories about buried treasure are pirate stories. Here's a Bible story about buried treasure. In a day when there were no banks, at least on the level of the common people, it was not uncommon for people to sometimes bury their wealth in a jar in their field. Jesus doesn't elaborate, but it sounds like whoever did that in his story must have passed away and the new owner had no idea there was a treasure in the field. I say that because don't you think if the original owner were still living he never would have sold the field as, uh, as happens in the story. So the field is apparently under new ownership and it raises a question. Was the finder unethical not to notify the owner of the field? that a treasure was there. This was probably a, uh, a peasant farmhand digging in someone else's field, hired to work in his field, stumbled on the treasure, but didn't reveal it to the owner, covered it back up, sold all he had, bought the field. We could debate all day the ethical nature of that decision. That's not Jesus' point in the parable. And to top it off, we're not a part of the culture of their day. We don't even think about ethics the same way that they did. We'll say this, the peasant who found the treasure was not portrayed as dishonest in the story. If he was dishonest, he would have just taken the treasure himself. Instead, he bought the field that it was in so that he would have full rights to the treasure. Well, the details are there just to support the story. We don't need to focus on that primarily. Uh, Phil and I were, were emailing this week. Phil, Phil made a, a, a great comment about our study in the parables that parables typically have one point to them. And that we can get off track sometimes if we start reading too much into the significance of all the details 
of the parables. Uh, that treats parables more like an allegory where everything has a hidden meaning. Now, I will say this, in the early parables in this chapter, Jesus did some of that. Like in the soils, he said the sower is the son of man, the seed is the word, and this soil represents this and this soil represents that. We saw it too with the wheat and the weeds, parable of the tares, because he said this is who sowed the bad field, the devil, uh, the harvesters are the angels. So uh, there, there's, there was some of that in those early parables. But as Jesus continued telling parables, they, uh, the degree to which the details are key to the story diminishes. The point of the parable is the main thing. Every parable teaches a point, and we need to focus on that and not get distracted. It, it is sometimes easy to get distracted. St. Augustine was one of the great... <clears throat> oh, pardon me, one of the great early Christians in the history of the church and one of the great teachers in the church, but he treated all the parables as allegories. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, for example, he looked for every hidden, every detail to have a hidden meaning about the man who was mugged and then the priest and the Levite didn't stop to help, but a Samaritan did. And so he said... Uh, uh, the man was taken to the inn to recover. Well, the inn represents the church. And um, the innkeeper was the Apostle Paul. And he was paid two coins to look after the man. And that's in the story. Jesus said uh, the, the Good Samaritan left two coins and said, I'll pay the difference when I come back. He said the, the two coins are loving God and loving others, the two definitions of love. And basically, he dissected the parable and left it dead on the table, I think. <laughs> it's, it misses the point. It misses the point. And so we can, we can lose ourselves in the details if we're not careful. The main detail here is there's a treasure. He found it. What was it worth? That's the question. It was worth everything that he had. Now hang on to that, because in verse 45, we get the companion parable. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Um, unlike the farmhand, he didn't stumble onto it. He was searching for it. But like the farmhand, when he found it, he gave up everything for it. They didn't just empty their wallets. They went home and sold everything they had. Literally every penny went into the purchase of the pearl or the field. So pretend for a second that we're in economics class. It's going to be hard to pretend because I wouldn't be teaching it if we were in economics <laughs> class. Is it a good deal or a bad deal? Is it a good deal or a bad deal if it costs you everything you have, every cent that you have? Is it a good deal or a bad deal? And, and the answer is it depends. It depends, right? It depends on what you get back. Because if what you get back is greater than what you spent, it's worth it. And if you get back is worth immeasurably more than what you spent, it's, it's, worship, it's, it's worth it in immeasurable amount. Uh, when I grew to adulthood and went back home one day to the house that I grew up in, I found out when I looked in my hiding place that my mom had given away my baseball cards. And all the men in the group are saying, mm-hmm, yeah, I understand what that was like. Yeah, my baseball cards were gone. And they were a valuable group of baseball cards. <laughs> uh, they weren't worth paper they were written on. But w what if I had sold everything I had to buy a baseball card? That would be foolish. Unless it was Honus Wagner. <laughs> Honus Wagner was in that first Hall of Fame class. Honus Wagner was considered the greatest player of his day, and his baseball card was printed in limited numbers 
I've got the statistics. One was sold recently, $7,250,000 for a baseball card. Talk about having to sell everything you have to buy it. But it's worth $7,250,000. So the, the question is a question of value. What's it worth? And the answer here is that the kingdom of God is worth everything. So in a beautifully memorable way, Jesus is saying, don't hold anything back in your search for God, whatever it costs. And he was talking to people who, like him, would lay down their lives for it. Whatever it costs. It's a bargain. It's worth it. The value of the treasure, the value of the pearl, the value of the kingdom. Let me put it to you like this. Do you suppose anybody in heaven regrets the price they had to pay to get there? And some of them had to give up fame, fortune, family, even their own lives. And they would say, there's no question. Of course it's worth it. Infinitely worth it. Jim Elliott was a missionary to the Aka Indians in the 1950s who died before he could begin and was an example of one who laid down his life. But Jim Elliot had written something in his diary before he went on that missionary enterprise. What he wrote was a question, a, 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 not a question, a statement to a question he had been asking himself. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. That's a modern application of the parable of the treasure and the parable of the pearl. He is no fool who gives up something he can't keep anyway, this life, for something he can't lose, eternal life. The farmhand in Jesus' story, the merchant in Jesus' story would say amen to that. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Alice, you're exactly right. Let's pray together. Lord, thanks for the reminder. Sometimes we put so much value on other things, things that may be valuable, but are they the most valuable? You are the most valuable. And help us to keep our values in perspective and live that way in Jesus' name. Amen.